Right. Okay. I suppose I should put this raccoon down. <laughs> You're an ugly raccoon. There we are. Job done. Right. Okay. So, everyone ready? Hello, welcome. Hello, welcome to the Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries all across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hello from Belgium. Alessio. Ciao a tutti. Audrey. Hey everyone. David. Hey people. And I'm your host, Finn. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics from across the hobby. And today, as always, we'll start with seeing how everyone's doing in the podcast catch up. And we'll also check in with our little Patreon and see how that's doing. So, how's everyone doing? Um, I've been doing very fine, uh, especially since yesterday we had uh, a nice little game, one of our Patreon. Uh, and we played some Calico in Park, which might be topics for later. Oh, spoilers. What else have you been? Uh, I've been painting a bit uh, lately. Um, I opened one of my Kingdom Death, uh, Death Grey Resin V. Hey, uh, resin quality, the only one I own. And I started painting it right away. No priming. Uh, and I like it. Mm. Yeah, no need to prime. Get straight in there. I, I like that. That's how I like to paint. Uh, David, what have you been up to? Yeah, I got a no nice birthday gift by my uh, an orc father, <laughs> and yeah, it was pretty good day so far. Okay, and Alessio? Yeah, uh, there's been quite a lot of stuff actually. Uh, first, the Patreon is doing well, so uh, there are uh, new Patreons, and I would really like to thank the Patreon is doing well, so uh, there are uh, new Patreons, and I would really like to thank each one of you, but you are too many. Uh, actually, no, so thank you, Dario, Remy, and Charles. Your support is very, very much appreciated, so you can give us the chance to be here thank you dario remy and charles your support is very very much appreciated so you can give us the chance to be here talking you about uh, unimportant stuff so uh that aside this has been a quite um, an interesting week because there have been a couple of kickstarters uh, vat and uh, a lot uh, of talk about the european and u.s taxes so yeah it's been a been a bit of drama over over sort of things going on and um it's it's been interesting it's going to be tough because brexit has uh had a lot of uh, implications everywhere people in stuff from .co.uk sites and then learning that in fact the sites are not located in the uk and they're delivering from places in europe germany for example and they're getting hit with huge custom fees so it's um oof, it's a bit of a, a bit of a mess but hopefully the board game industry will be able to navigate any people are getting um, stung for stuff that they never thought was coming. And uh, from Europe, um, a lot of the stuff ordered from the US usually went through a loophole in the tax system through the UK um, to avoid uh, paying too much uh, taxes. Uh, taxes. So now that it's closed, <laughs> things are getting a, a little bit more expensive. Um, but the biggest problem is always when a uh, manufacturer did not um, plan ahead of that and the customer is up is uh, hit with like custom handling taxes and custom handling taxes and stuff like that which yeah. go on top of the normal tax that the uh, seller should really just take care of yeah the problem is it being I will say unexpected it's not exactly unexpected because we knew brexit was coming. Yeah, it's been like five years now. Now the company has to collect us coming. Yeah, it's been like five years now. Now the company has to collect the taxes. And so for everything that was uh, standing, that's where the problem are. No, actually, it is uh, even more than that, because uh, it's not just a problem of importing stuff, but it's actually an export problem too. Even more than that, because uh, it's not just a problem of importing stuff, but it's actually an export problem too, because a lot of, it, of Kickstarters, starting from European companies, uh, 
have been criticized because they are actually including VAT in their prices and when stuff gets exported it's like the yeah. sometimes it's shipping expenses sometimes it's taxes actually uh, in the end I think that all that matters is that a game has a price and when it's European we have to pay more that's uh, I think that happens and it happens the other way around but of course it's uh, still money we're talking about so it's a sense we will probably see more evolutions in the coming months as the company adjusts what they do and how they communicate yeah that might be a topic for a future episode maybe we can shed some light on it like on the development and yeah. uh... we will ask our patreons if they want yeah sure yeah definitely could be an interesting topic it's now the time i talk to you about king's dilemma now Yes! <laughs> oh, it was about time. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's time to talk about the rather wonderful King's Dilemma. Take it away. Yeah, please. Uh, let me introduce you to the magical world of Ankist. It's a kingdom, actually. And it's the place where the, where the story of King's Dilemma is set up. So, uh, King's Dilemma, what is it, King's... What is it? It's a board game, it's a legacy board game, designed by Hjalmar Hack and Lorenzo Silva, and is published by Horrible Guild. Uh, it's a 2020 game, been around for a while. There has been a bit of scarcity because the first uh, print run got uh, sold out pretty quickly. So uh, there's now a second batch coming basically to every country. I think the last one, uh, the last batch uh, got to USA in these days, in these weeks. Uh, so uh, there's now abundance of King's Dilemma and this is why we want to introduce this game to you. You say that, but I already cannot get my hands on it. Literally every single copy that was coming in was already reserved and bought everywhere from my uh, suppliers. So that, that's just how good it is. <laughs> Basically, uh, what is King's Dilemma? So. Uh, it's a game which is uh, which offers uh, a twist on the legacy mechanic. Uh, I'll be more on that later. I want to talk you about. Uh, uh, I want to talk you about uh, uh, the the visual impact first. So uh, visually, the game is absolutely nothing to write home about because it's a very simple game with a low production value. You are going to destroy this game, and the game knows it. So. Uh, the, the components are real cheap to destroy this game and the game knows it so uh, the, the components are real cheap and this could be the, the, the real put of the, of the game because you are paying 60 euros, 60 dollars, 70 euros, 70 dollars, 80 euros, 80 dollars actually uh, I don't know about the pricing 75 euros here Oh, and okay. it's, it's available in French, but not in English on the biggest French website. Sorry, Fen. Ouch. Yeah, so th th that's it. Uh, you are paying a lot for this game, and uh, the components are quite cheap. It's all cheap cardboard, cheap cardstock, and uh, the game is overall cheap. And uh, I promise you, the thing that it, it does good is separating the single session and the overall campaign. And that is why I think that the Legacy game is done very, very well. Uh, in a single game, you are a generation of uh, uh, the counselors of the king of, en of Enkist. You actually are the help the king making decision. The entire session uh, lasts as long as the king uh, reign lasts. So basically, if the king dies of old age, you have done a, you have done a good job for the kingdom. If the king is forced to abdicate, to abdicate because either the kingdom is going in ruins because the population is unsatisfied and there's no stability in the reign because everything is going to literal hell and or because uh, actually the, the things are going too good so there are, is going to literal hell and or because uh, actually the, the things are going too good, so there are patricians and noblemen and everyone who just uh, forced the king to abdicate. I just want to say, this mechanic, uh, it just struck me, it's exactly like the mechanic, it's exactly like the mechanic used in the app game Reigns, if you've ever heard of that. Yes, I, I, I was going to mention it. I played that as well. 
Yeah, th there are a lot of parallels with games like Reigns and other uh, uh, binary choices games because uh, so what you do in, if you play the app games uh, or uh, Steam games uh, where, uh, where there are uh, card card based binary choices you already know what's happening because basically uh, you are faced with a dilemma with ethical and actual uh, factual uh, consequences and you have to uh, uh, when everyone has voted, uh, if nobody overbid, so it's basically a bidding game here, uh, the side with most power uh, bet on it wins. So they get to spend the power and the consequences for that vote uh, are recited, uh, recovers, gets back their power for future votations. So uh, if I understand correctly, Every player gets to, to vote, but only one player applies the consequences and pay for it uh, in the end? Uh, not exactly, but mostly, because what happens is that uh, there, there are... Not exactly, but mostly, because what happens is that uh, there, there are two sides. So uh, let's say we are four players, two players decide to vote A and uh, two players decide to vote Nay. Uh, and uh, the A side has four power on it, while the A side has two power on it. Has four power on it, while the A side has two power on it. A wins. Now, uh, in the A side, there there will be one player who will be the leader and will be the uh, signee because actually you will sign the the law you are passing. Uh, you physically sign the card. Will be the leader if you are the player who bet the more power on that outcome. So if we played, uh, I played the three powers and you played just one power, I am the leader of the votation, so I will get to sign. Uh, yeah, but is it um, actually the players are in a position and needs to vote for themselves? I thought that the purpose was to make the king live as long as possible and not get get him. No, no. The um the, the purpose is your uh, I think it's each generation you're dealt a card that gives you a set of goals and you're trying to uh, adjust the various tracks up and down to get to your set of goals then you'd be winning. There's other little bits and pieces as well, but essentially you're kind of hit hiding away what you're really after. Um and if you can do very well at controlling and manipulating people, you get others to to vote and lead on agendas that help you advance your position. Okay, so each player is playing for themselves and the king... Okay, so each player is playing for themselves and the king is more of a, a track to when the round ends and the condition of that uh, round ends rather than the actual uh, an actual winning or losing condition, right? Uh, mostly, no, but thanks for your question because uh, the, that's actually the very next subject. Uh, right? Uh, mostly, no, but thanks for your question because uh, that, that's actually the very next subject. Uh, the fact is that uh, the kingdom is represented by five resources, which are actually not resources because they are basically your scoreboards. So uh, the five think it's on the nine track and they can go from zero to 18 and uh, they uh, basically every consequence of your actions will raise or lower some of these uh, scores when they end with them they will uh, bring with them the stability of the king. The stability will go very very high the kingdom will collapse because the, the king will be forced to abdicate otherwise if the if something like welfare goes very very low and it brings the the kingdom stability with it the people will start a revolution that's basically it so uh, you have a secret goal uh, like uh, fan said and basically you will uh, aim at some sections of the board for example, there's an objective moderate, which will say that you will score more victory point at the end if you have most on the middle of the track. Otherwise, you could be greedy and you would want a lot of stuff, actually a, 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 an average number of stuff on the high end of the track. So basically everyone has uh, conflicting objectives. Yeah, so you have to balance that um, your own 
goal for this specific uh, game and your global goal for the rest of the the party so that your legacy can be um... kind of but often you'll find what actually boils down is you're constantly uh, maneuvering and positioning to try and get gather as much power what actually boils down is you're constantly uh, maneuvering and positioning to try and get gather as much power as you can for yourself um through various different things it's interesting how if you're able I, I, this is one of the things I found. If you're somebody who can't set aside your own personal morals and ethics when playing this, your own personal morals and ethics when playing this game, some years you'll have a lot of problems because your goals ask you to vote in a direction that you know you 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 don't want totally to. Totally true. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so you have to be morally flexible while gaming and just look. This is what I I want and need. But and a big part of the draw is if you can get into that, you suddenly realise essentially you this is what politics at a high level can boil down to. It's not about the results. It's about the power. It's about getting what you want and getting your way and getting your agenda pushed through and trampling over everyone else. That's why I would constantly be looking for the uh, guillotine edge. This is a, a system which is basically very simple because you have to just vote A or A and try to bribe or influence or talk your way to have the votes go your way. But what really is cool is that if you actually have it your way, uh, the kingdom could... What really is cool is that if you actually have it your way, uh, the kingdom could collapse at any moment, even in an unfavorable moment for you. So, for once, it could be important for you to vote against your own uh, uh, favorable moment for you. So, for once, it could be important for you to vote against your own uh, your own uh, benefit, because that would keep the king alive for a bit more so that you can further other objectives or even further those goals you will actually lose victory points because in the end we are talking of victory points so uh, this is uh, the, the the real subtlety of the of the system which is working very good and it's a cool cool representation of politics so uh, you said that it was a legacy game there some level of replayability if you try to play different house or if you uh, mix and match some different cards. Well, uh, this is more legacy than other games because I think that when you are done with it, you will probably know uh, how some decision will, will evolve. Uh, and actually, if you play the you attach the stickers everywhere, so that could be a problem to play. Of course, uh, the, the, another very good thing in this uh, day and age is that this game could be easily played over the internet with... Uh, with a Excel spreadsheet, and I think that Horrible Guild in Tabletopia uh, mod to play it uh, online, if provided that, that someone has the cards to read. So if someone owns the game, you can play over the network for free. To be brutally honest, um, this is one of the big negatives for the game. Uh, I've I've looked at the game. You can play over the network for free. To be brutally honest, um, this is one of the big negatives for the game. Uh, I've I've looked around, I've spoken to people. Many people who love it have a second copy, so that's driving scarcity further. And it honestly feels like this is a legacy game that's better played in a better played in an electronic format. Um, there is branching paths, from what I've heard, and the story can take strange turns, different turns depending on who's playing. So. Um, as I said, quite a few people I talked to about it who played through said, I'm ever so glad I have a second copy so I can play it again sometime. And exp because, um, for example, Pandemic Legacy had the advantage that when you get to the end, you can still play the, the Pandemic game. It's still yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And you can even replay some of the older decision because some of the, the transformation that happened in the game aren't that uh, quote unquote game break, quote unquote game breaking. Yeah, you you end up with a playable game at the end that's a little bit unique compared to everyone else's. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering how. Like, uh, I think that it sounds like the game is best played with a fixed uh, number of players, and then over several sessions. <clears throat> what uh, amount of playtime are we looking? Are we looking. 
Oh, uh, this is uh, actually uh, a good point about this game. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Horrible Guild says that uh, it's completed on average on 16 sessions, and the sessions can be very quick. I think every session is... Uh, a so when there's more discussion, sometimes you go to an hour and a half, and sometimes if someone gets to kill the king very, very early, you get you get you play sessions as short as ten minutes. It happened in our kingdom. <laughs> so yeah, basically, is a three to five players. Uh, I have to say a, a thing about player count. This game is best played at full player count. Uh, there's a, a popular variant on the internet uh, which you could read about, which just balances the 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 points scored to a sixth player. But uh, I would advise against that because playing in six means that every time there are all the secret objectives in play because the the total number of secret objectives is six. So, uh, basically, some strategies which work because you never know if that specific secret objective is in play on that session will not work if you play with six players. So, I, I advise against that, but I, I advise to play this game with the same five people from start to finish. That's actually, it's our Thursday night uh, currently. Mm. Suggest maybe um, with more time in development, uh, Horrible Guild would have been better off creating more than just six uh, sets of objectives to increase variance um, in what player goals are to, to obfuscate them a little bit more. Yeah, actually, this, this is called the dilemma. Called the dilemma system, the one they are using. We will probably won't see anything anymore about King's Dilemma, but we will see more games with this system, which I would say uh, they are naturally politically oriented. But uh, more games with this system, they are actually a cool thing because this system works. Them works very well. I can't wait for the eventual samurai or Japanese themed one followed by the zombie themed one sci-fi sci kings dilemma and probably the pirate one where you have to manage a mutiny <laughs> the shogun's dilemma yeah so the pirate one where you have to manage a mutiny <laughs> the shogun's dilemma yeah so uh, this is basically the game on the session part of the big part of the legacy game. Now, I want just to say one last thing about the legacy part, which is the coolest part of it. I actually find that I played a lot of games like Risk Legacy. I played the Pandemic Season 1 and 2, not yet 0. I... Uh, I, I tried a bit, uh, or I, I tried a lot of uh, legacy games, and I found them to be unimportant because a big part of it has already been decided, and in the end, what will change is just a bit of text in the end because you could score more or less points. Now, uh, the cool thing about King's Dilemma is that you have eight stories, eight main the as long as you complete those stories, you will uncover uh, an ending sticker which uh, will have a part of the big final of fina finale of the game and uh, that sticker you uncover, instead of another sticker you uncover, big final of fina finale of the game and uh, that sticker you uncover instead of another sticker you uncover will change the rules for the final uh, for the final episode. Now uh, I didn't yet play this final session, so I don't know actually how it will play out. I actually how it will play out. I sadly spoiler spoiled a part of it for myself to uh, be able to to get here and talk of this about uh, about this for you, with you but uh, that's actually cool because the, the uh, kind of permanent uh, currency you are in the sessions which is prestige and crave prestige if you did well crave if you if you put your ambition over the wellness of the kingdom the two uh, scoring these two kinds of current they will be used differently depending on how the story evolves. So it it is actually 
it is actually a, an, an, an incentive to care about it. And that's a very cool for a legacy game. Hmm. Yeah, so King's Dilemma is certainly beating a path towards a new style of uh, legacy game. What's just going to need to remain is how the public feels about essentially uh, I'm paying for the exemplary or, or something. Uh, we'll see how how people yeah. do it. But the reception to King's Dilemma has been very positive all around. Oh, and I would like to say as we're on the subject of legacy games... Um, I'm not going to say which legacy game this is from, but if you're going to design a legacy game and you're going to include an element where you have to compare how where you have to compare how you did versus everybody else on a global website, don't do that because it's really frustrating <laughs> because the later you play, the the harder it is to get the success condition and to be honest, that particular game that did that, we stopped playing at exactly after we looked at that thing and went, "Oh, stopped playing at exactly after after we looked at that thing and went, oh, well, this is garbage. <laughs> I had no idea this existed, and I want to know the game so that I don't play it. I don't know, but that, that thing you mentioned was what ru ruined the Mass Effect 3 ending for me. Well, if, if you really need to know, spoilers coming, close your ears if, if you, the listeners, don't want to know. Um, but it was Charterstone, which I loved up until that moment. And then I got we got very fr frustrated with it. We've not been back to it for three years. Oh, that's good to know. The rest, the rest oh, of the game thanks. is fantastic, but I just, we were like, there's no way in heck we could ever score the kind of scores people are putting here. So this is basically a non-entity. This is a failure because other people have replayed it or done exceptionally well above the curve and forget about it. You know, um, as long as we are uh, throwing names, I would say that uh, legacy mechanics do not belong in that one. Naming no names. Anyway, um, f now we go from uh, one lot of royalty of kings and courts to another bunch of princes and princesses with cats and quilts. It's time for Audrey to take us through Calico. Yeah, Calico, I bought this game a month ago and I've already done two games of it. So that's my most play board game of the month. <laughs> Um, for a very short summary, Calico is a board uh, is a board game where players take turns drawing tiles and putting them on their boards, or the opposite way around, putting tiles on their boards and then drawing them. The idea will their boards, or the opposite way around, putting tiles on their boards and then drawing them. The idea will be to put them together on the board so there are spaces for the tiles and to make combinations of either colors of the tiles or patterns to make the most beautiful quilt. When you make a group of color, you make a group of color of the same color, there are six colors in the game, you can earn a button to uh, sew on your quilt. When you make groups of the same pattern, you can get a cat that comes and sleeps on your quilt. That's it for the most part of the game with Jean that you have a few personal objectives to them so these are tiles that you that are put on your board and the tiles around can make objectives based on the colors or the patterns. There are six colors as I said and six different patterns. Each color plus pattern combination is present three times in the game so there is a lot of randomness because at total each player draws 22 tiles so out of more than 100 tiles there may be some colors some patterns that you may not even see during a game it's highly unlikely but it could happen and for sure some color plus pattern combinations will not be such uh, addresses the randomness so it sort of differentiates itself from most uh, tile matching game because this in this one each tile has two value. It both has the pattern and the color, right? Yes. Every space objective that you can have on your bond ca can be completed with and the color, right? Yes. Every space objective that you can have on your bond ca can be completed with patterns or with colors or if you're very lucky with both. And they score more points if you complete it with both. 
Yeah, um, I I had a chance to play this a little bit. I only played the solo variant uh, due to time. To play this a little bit. I only played the solo variant uh, due to time pressures. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but for, I would say that's really good because it's not just score as high as you can score, or you're playing against an AI opponent as good as the um, Autonoma Factory opponents are. I will say, um, but this one you have a scenario and it'll say uh, it's fascinating to play because the board is very tight there's only a limited number of spaces and you've got so many different ways of scoring so you're you're juggling like you're looking and going okay well i need to put two of the same pattern over here but i really want to expand that into a big enough pattern in order to attract this cat over um but then i need these colors in a group to get the button and it's it's great because you have to make cuts and um, harsh sort of like okay I'm giving up on this particular thing to in pursuit of points and on top of that with people or in this case in the solo um, thing the track removing tiles you thing the track removing tiles you might want in the future you've really got to look and be like Ooh, okay which one from the market is is what what do I need what do I want which one of these two tiles in hand can I hold on to for for the longest possible before I play it um, and, and so on. I, I thought it was really good. Um, I didn't have a chance. I thought it was really good. Um, I didn't have a chance to play with the advanced cats, but I took a look at them and I was like, oh, okay, that's that's way more interesting than the basic cats, which are good for learning. But you have to put the patterns down in a shape that they want as well. Yeah, I really enjoy that the game has a beginner set as a beginner setup, then regular setup, uh, then almost the expert setup depending on wh wh what you want to add and there is also the family variant in which you don't use the objectives so it's it's really sun it feels sandboxy to me and really you can adapt depending on your point system I, I think that it's the winning part is the separation between pattern and color which gives uh, a small board like that a lot of depth in the decision space well i think the winning part's actually the theme um there's often <laughs> this this is a a tile laying game um and i say it reminds me of isle of cats and of course um patchwork uh but also reminds me of tiny towns but the thing is in tiny towns you don't feel like you're building a town at all really you're just kind of placing the buildings and the colors to try and condense them down to get the particular uh building that you need i will say tiny town killer uh building that you need I will say Tiny Towns is amazing in its own way, and definitely if you enjoy Calico, you will enjoy Tiny Towns. But Calico just nails it. As as somebody who has a mother who loves cats and makes quilts, this this is like it, it is it's real, yeah. When you are making this, this is like it, it is it's real, yeah. When you are making a quilt <laughs> and you have a cat around, they are very likely to just come along and go. That's nice. You're working on there. I'm going to sit on this bit that you need to move a bit later, and then I'm going to refuse to move. It's it really is, and it just I love that games to move. It's it really is, and it just I love that games are expanding to cover weird, odd things. It's not just traditional fantasy or hey, these are trains or this is what happened in this war. Refight it. It's okay. You're making a, a quilt. You're knitting. You're you're a seamstress. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's it, it's it's to my my mother and um, it, it as a well, maybe not at the moment. I'm afraid. Unfortunately, the family cat passed away recently, and she's very upset about it. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, it was. Sorry to hear that. It, it was. It was. It was very sad. The poor uh, poor girl. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, it and it's very accessible and it's easy. Colors and shapes. Super yeah. easy to get into. Personally, for me, like the standouts, it just looks super comfy. Like uh, it's visually <laughs> pleasing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's um it's a very beautiful game. Um, <laughs> it's got competition yeah. this time. One funny thing is that as soon as I started talking about it, my cat can came on my desk and asked for pets. I don't know yeah. if he can understand it, but it was perfectly timed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, to to bounce off on what you were saying, I think that the thing that I is that it's really easy to learn, and there's no uh, learning learning curve at all. Like you can devise strategy, you can think about how you'll play, but from the get go, you know how the game 
uh, will unfold. And so it's it's really ju uh, easy to pick up and to play one or two games in an evening with your mm -hmm. how the game uh, will unfold. And so it's it's really ju uh, easy to pick up and to play one or two games in an evening with your family. Yeah. Um, while other games, you might want to uh, learn the rules and sort of um, uh, have a, a steeper uh, time to to learn the the proper strategy. Yeah. To learn the the proper strategy. Yeah. Uh, what I what I really enjoyed was also that for the entire game, uh, trying to pursue multiple ob objectives is usually uh, risk to be your, your downfall. If you try to do, go for multiple things at the same time, you might end up painting your you might end up painting a lot of um, uh, brain power to follow the different. Uh, oh, okay, so this color I need for this, but I also need this pattern. If I have this, this pattern, this color in this exact combination, I can have it. Uh, it it's it's a very interesting game. I kept in my hand for the entire game uh, one specific um, tile, which one of my pattern, but I was expecting to find uh, something that would work better. Uh, it it was um it was a lot of fun. The only thing that I think might be a slight problem with the game is that the um, uh, patterns can be very busy busy looking, and sometimes it's hard to to just keep an eye on whip an eye on which card is which pattern. Um, yeah, yeah, some I, are a I, bit hard to notice and read. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that the uh, the physical game is easier on the eye, though. Sla uh, slightly. It just looks beautiful, though. One thing that I think is very interesting in the game is that you can select your objectives because if you want, though. one thing that I think is very interesting in the game is that you can select your objectives because if you want to play on buttons and patterns. And just that, and not care about the objective, you're playing low risk, low reward. But if you want to do the objectives, you're playing high risk, high reward. So you definitely can uh, combine different uh, strategies, and that's really interesting. And one thing that's interesting is the price point of Calico. It's a game that costs less than 30 euros. Yeah, it, is. Yeah, it seems to be a perfect family game. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I I all the pictures. It is just cardboard for forty euros. It's very pretty cardboard. There's paisley and everything, and pictures of cats, as everyone knows, are priceless. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was I thinking? Of course. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a. Uh... A beautiful game it's an easy game it's easy to pick up but i would say it has a low skill floor but a very high skill ceiling you know if you're going to try and score very big points it, yeah. it does take a lot of thinking and and intelligent play but fortunately that's only having two tiles at a time to play really just stops you from getting overwhelmed so you're you, you are because you're having to think about so much about where you're going to put these particular tiles and leaving space for future positions so it, it has a very tight uh, design it does it it, it, it really does and as, I, as i said earlier um some it really does and as, I, as i said earlier um some games like this can feel exhausting this one is about the right length that you don't burn out when playing it you sort of get near to the end and you're like oh yeah so close i reckon if only things had gone a little bit more differently you know i could have scored some more so it's a it's a very good game more differently you know i could have scored some more so it's a it's a very good game and i think it's an easy recommendation for anyone who's got um people who family members friends who are a little bit more uh, spatial physical um, and are looking for something that difficulty to match and fit them however suits you and suits yeah them. for sure it's good design for a simple game mm. well speaking of which we're gonna go from uh, having a, a quilt with a cat sat on it to having a sleeping bag with yourself lying in it with another very beautiful game Parks. Well, the bear's friendly in this. So Parks is from Keymaster Games in um, in collaboration with the 59 Parks uh, print series, which is a series of uh, art pieces about all of the 59 parks of America. Parks is um, let's it's a game that plays one to five players, and several people who played it solo and two players have said it is great with any number of players whatsoever. It's got a solid 
very enjoyable, very difficult solo mode with a lot of decisions. And then just adding more players doesn't cost the game anything. So part two hikers, they're represented by very cute little specifically made meeples. Um, they trek along for over four seasons, a trail that's randomized through budget tiles that gets gradually longer and longer. On your turn, you're going to take your hiker and you're going to move them to any space on the trail in front of where you were. A trail that's randomized through budget tiles that gets gradually longer and longer. On your turn, you're going to take your hiker and you're going to move them to any space on the trail in front of where you were. You can't go backwards because just like in life, when you're hiking, turning around is not an option, apparently. At least here it isn't. I guess hiking, turning around is not an option, apparently. At least here it isn't. I guess the park rangers might have a word to you if you if you go back or more importantly, you're probably looking at more beautiful things along the way. Each space has its own built in ability. Most of these give you tokens. Um, they uh, and all they do on them. Weather is determined by the season. It's either going to be rain or splendor slash sun. Um, and you'll be collecting these neat little wooden tokens. So the game essentially collect tokens, convert tokens into points. So how do you convert tokens into points? You can spend them on, you can spend them on buying national park cards, which are the uh, there are three cards available each season. They have a cost on them, usually includes uh, mountains and forests, and then some amount of water or and splendor and or. Uh, it varies a bit. They're worth a, a variable amount of points. The more points they're worth, the harder they Basically, this is you saying, I want to buy this later. Uh, I can't afford it right now. You might want to do that because you've got a goal that requires you to go to a certain number of water parks at the end of the year. Or you might not care. You, your goal might be to take X number of photographs. Who knows? You, you get dealt that at the beginning. Um, other than not care, you, your goal might be to take X number of photographs. Who knows? You, you get dealt that at the beginning. Um, other things you can do is when you receive water, you can pop it in a canteen. The canteens will do various different things. Um, the most basic of them is you get to turn a water into, say, a mountain or a forest token, which is great because water's way more co water. You can pop it in a canteen. The canteens will do various different things. Um, the most basic of them is you get to turn a water into, say, a mountain or a forest token, which is great because water's way more common than forests and mountains. You can also, at the end of each season, spend splendor on buying gear for season for each of your um, hikers and spaces can get taken by other players in advance End spaces can get taken there are bonuses for being the first to complete the trail so the whole thing reminds me of Takedo in that you're trying to move as little as possible each turn to eke out as much value as you can you've got to do the camera space that's very far up I can't let anyone else take the camera from me I have to sacrifice all of this along the way what I really enjoy is that it also incentivized the, the players to sort of um go into space to take them from other player and make sure that they don't take too much advantage of it all to really strong a uh, little stuff like that makes the the whole you can move as many spaces you want at the same time um to to really uh adds a lot of tactic to the game and that's from the little experience that i had playing it with um uh, remy and audrey um, um that's really what the game felt, is that there's a lot of little mechanics that seem innocuous, but actually uh, bring a lot of tactic and, and depth to the game. Yeah, your first season is a short trail of five different places. There's a short amount of weather on there, um, and you'll make a decision to maybe buy some gear or perhaps a trail of five different places. There's a short amount of weather on there. Um, and you'll make a decision to maybe buy some gear or perhaps reserve a park or even buy one at the end. Uh, pretty simple. But then and the next season, a new piece of trail will be added in, everything gets randomized, and you may have now have some gear or some extra canteens that change, and you may have now have some gear or some extra canteens that changes up how you're doing things, and you're, you're sort of building an engine as you go and gaining momentum, and hopefully by the third and fourth season, you'll have a, a good way of generating a decent amount of points but other players can be interfering with that whether intentionally or not or even that whether intentionally or not or even because they're completing the trail faster than you that's it last hiker has to get 
get catch up with everyone. They don't get to dawdle their way up the trail. They've got to get to the end and make their decision. So it's that extra piece of pressure. Yeah, and the trail is randomized every time. Here is at the very end of the trail. You might take your time to get there, or if it's at the very start, you might want to rush ahead with one of your hikers so that you can have the um, resources to buy uh, to buy more gear. It um, it keeps the game really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it, it, you you always have the same basic locations, but they're advanced. There's an extra tile for four plus players as well. Um, which I haven't had a chance to play with, but it's, it's a good way of visually seeing how much longer is left in the game and how many seasons are, are left to go. Um, you add on top of that weather uh, to be determined each season, which the seasons give you a extra ability. That weather uh, to be determined each season, which the seasons give you a extra ability um, that can vary and also deploy the weather tokens in a randomized pattern and that adds more uh, more even more variance and more things to think about and you can't plan for it you don't know what each season is going to be like you just know there's going to be some rain and there's going to be some going to be like you just know there's going to be some rain and there's going to be some sun and you might get some of these what I really enjoyed also is that the opportunity to um, visit park so to, to spend your resources to convert them into points uh, are sort of limited and if you want to buy uh, all of the park that interests you you kind of have to to really uh, budget for that and maybe buy less gear or get less canteen if you want to get the points that you need it's it's a really well o- almost like um like calico tightly designed yeah. game it really feels like they refined each mechanic uh, for a long time absolutely considering all you're doing on your turn is deciding how far you're moving moving one hiker and then collecting whatever happens on that particular tile at its core um it's it, it, there's a awful lot of branching decisions and things that happen i really like that uh, your options get more complex over time because the gears that you have the canteens that you have will open more options i'm buying this and now i have this option and you have time to see it and to use it and to understand how you can make uh uh, basically, mm. uh, a resource building engine. Yeah, um, that reminds me in many ways of Glory to Rome, um, which is a fantastic yeah. card game, uh, but other engine building games, uh, but other engine building games as well, tableau building games, where you are iterating on your m- machine, um, but you kind of don't even realize until you're on well, like two, three seasons in, you may be like, suddenly, like, hang on a minute, I'm building, I'm building this mechanism machine to try and support my end game goal, which is uh, whatever I've dealt been dealt at the start or and support my end game goal which is uh, whatever i've dealt been dealt at the start or once you're used to it you can dealt two goals and pick one to to go for um, yeah you, you definitely discover it with the canteens as they're drawn from face down so you don't know what mm. you're getting yeah while the gears you have a bit more choice you do. but yeah canteen is like oh what what am i getting okay yeah you've got to adapt on the fly with them yeah and they might be useless uh, besi- besides those player interaction where you can pretty much block movement, there's not much uh, like more interaction between the players, right? Um, no, it's you're not directly uh, interacting with it, with it, anyone else. You are simply taking um, spaces that they might want to go to. But considering the whole game is about going to a space to get stuff, it actually feels very interactive. Yeah, it, you might be competing for the same uh, parks to visit, but uh, overall, there's a feeling of in the trail. What I, what is really interesting is that your turn goes by very quickly. Uh, you just move along the trail and do like one action on it, and it's always going to be the same. But it also constantly feels strategic because you are thinking with uh, the other players in mind, with your other goals, with your fuel, other goals, with your canteen, with your gear. Um, it was really fun to see that a turn would take maybe less than a minute. Yeah. Um, so did did you both have a chance to play with the expansion or did you just play a learning game with, with the game as is? Uh, we had the expansion on the... With the game as is. Uh, we had the expansion on the tabletop simulator mod, but the problem was we couldn't find the year cards from the uh, game itself, from the core game. So we played with your cards from the expansions, and we, when we drew uh, parks from the expansion, we didn't use them the tent because we didn't know what the tent was. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so it was a big stuff, a mix-up. A bit of a mix-up. Okay. So uh, nightfall. 
uh, was the first expansion of Parks. Um, it doesn't change the game too much. Uh, each player gets to start with a wildlife token, and that's my chance to talk about them. So wildlife tokens in this game are wild. Also, each one individually unique. So there's a bunny, a bison, a moose, um, a wonderful little wolf, uh, who's my favorite, a fish, and so on. Um, uh, and in um, Nightfall, everybody starts with one because suddenly there's more pressure on the tokens. You get a bunch of new extra parks to bring it. Um, these extra parks are worth less, but they have special abilities when you buy them. So they add a little bit more to the purchase inside of things. Uh, just as an example, um, the uh, Cat My National Park, once you buy it, you get to reserve or purchase. Speaking of beautiful little tokens, uh, if anybody is interested, they can come onto our Discord because our fan posted some uh, really pretty pictures of the game. Yeah, yeah, I, I was playing around with uh, with taking some photos while playing. Uh, I will say the first photo of the wolf, um, it doesn't ever actually appear on that tile, but he just he wanted to be there. So the wolf, um, it doesn't ever actually appear on that tile, but he just he wanted to be there um yeah <laughs> uh so the next um section of nightfall is you get the campsite action so there's going to be a bunch of uh, the tents that are put out on the track when you land on a trail of uh, the tents that are put out on the track when you land on a trail site you use it as usual or you get to do the campsite action which means you pitch the tent um and they have a separate bunch of campsites on a track below that do other different stuff. You get to like turn in resources to get more resources. Uh, take a get to like turn in resources to get more resources. Uh, take a photo, get a canteen, etc. So it adds more options to what you're doing, um, rather than adding a extra bunch of complex things. In essence, it expands each campsite space. To give you more choices it's making them very valuable indeed so valuable that when you play the solo mood mood mode the um the park rangers knock over the campsites whenever they get to them and clean them up so you have to get get there ahead of them if you want to make use of them it's a, a very simple expansion um it does bring me to the only the expansion is literally a few extra cards for the for the park's deck to bring it up to the full 59 and an additional set of um like the um goals cards and things and there's no space in the main game to fit them in and this is a wonderfully designed tray from um it's just perfect except i can't get rid of the nightfall box i have to have both up on my shelf um and i guess maybe if um parks is going to be putting together more expansions that's not quite so bad because you can't expect the box to keep expanding endlessly. But um, this is a box to keep expanding endlessly. But um, it's a very different size in the Nightfall box. It is, um, it's way short, not shorter, but um, it's it's not as wide. So it it doesn't sit in the same profile next to it on the shelf. The way that the, say the root expansions all have the same box shelf. The way that the say the root expansions all have the same box. Um, dimensions just different depth um this this doesn't it, it's a gorgeous box it just the expansion doesn't look good when sat next to it unless you want to leave blank space behind it on your shelf high frontier has the same problem high frontier has the same problem so yeah um but that said everything about this game is what i would call luxury this is if, if you were going to ask what a boutique game is i would point to this and say this is <laughs> unique art for every single card it's a little bit towards the support of the national parks um all the tokens are gorgeous they they feel nice to play with they are well cut um they feel a little bit rustic you know how sometimes wooden tokens can be very densely dyed and very solid and they're fun to play with and they look good um but these like you like you bought them from a gift shop at the um at the national park you know so someone makes them there on site or something uh in, in contrast the hikers and the tents feel very like robust and and more traditional yeah one of the patron pointed out that those um those park uh, one of the patron pointed out that those um those park uh card look a lot like sort of old pamphlets 
Tai presentation for parks, which look which uh, look really beautiful and pretty. Well, it's um it's a whole actual thing. Fifty nine parks dot net has all of these prints available. Has all of these prints available for you to to buy. So, uh, <laughs> so you can you can even get a gold membership um to get access to like a load of credit for the shop and pick them all up. Honestly, if I lived in America and I didn't have to deal with import fees, I would be looking at maybe picking up one or two of these. It, uh, the whole art style looks a lot like um, Overwatch, which is uh, a video game that uh, was based in uh, in American parks. And it has also that sort of uh, kind of dimmed color uh, look to it. That's not the Overwatch. I Did I say Overwatch? I meant Firewatch. Ah! I was a little confused. Ah. I was a little confused for a moment. But Firewatch, yes, I get that. Um, it reminds me as well of as the Long Dark, which has um, it's a Canadian oh, yeah. video game about survival in um, the wilderness, and there's a bit of that in here as well. That kind of very beautiful um, li- line-free style. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty game, and it's very accessible. Um, but also has that depth of iterating and building your engines and coming to understand what you do for each different particular goal and adapting to it along the way. I, I'm very happy I picked it up. Very pleased with it. Also reminds me of... I, I'm very happy I picked it up. Very pleased with it. Also reminds me of that uh, improvise, adapt and overcome. <laughs> and it's in pre-order for now in France. Coming next month. Well, oh yeah, and that's something else that's worth mentioning. The game has so few bits of language. Yeah, and that's something else that's worth mentioning. The game has so few bits of language on it. Like uh, you could play the English copy with people who can't speak English, and you only have to explain a couple of cards. And you, it, because it's all open information, it doesn't matter if they're not sure. You can always come back and say that's what this card does. Yeah, that's a high recommendation. For less than 45 euros, it's really, yeah, if the component quality is as you said, that's really good value. The component quality and everything is amongst some of the best I've ever had in a board game. Um, I would say that the iOS is better. Both of them had the problem of not really having room for expansions, but you know, if you're just buying parks, and by itself, it's an amazing game, and the expansion is not anywhere at all essential. It's yeah, it's just perfect. The um, the token trays I forgot to mention this one on either side, and they're little like um, shaped like logs of wood. Very pretty. Yeah, so that is um, my recommendation for the month, and I would say it's. Uh, for anyone who enjoys work recommendation for the month, and I would say it's uh, for anyone who enjoys worker placement style or track style games and wants something that they can play with their family or people who are not so in, into gaming or even with people who might struggle with English language being a required and want something that they can play with their family or people who are not so in, into gaming or even with people who might struggle with English language being a requirement. This one has a very um, low English requirement and, and just always draws attention. Yeah. Yeah, and you can even just spend time looking at the cards. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Well, it is a work of art, genuinely. Mm. So, as uh, just like Parks is a journey over entirely one year, flowing from start to finish over season to season, we've gone through end or the end of the podcast. So, that has been this episode of The Last Standee. Uh, I hope you've had a good time, an enjoyable time. I really do hope that you consider seriously buying um, some of the games that we talked about because all of them are fantastic even the ones we get calico and uh, king's dilemma and especially parks but get tiny towns as well get king's dilemma if you can find if it. if you can find it yes i, I ended up getting tiny towns mm. <laughs> i love it right uh <laughs> so you can catch us on now our patreon where g www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee. Remember, it's two E's in standee. 
not one. The extra E is for exciting. Right? And that's all we have time for. So uh, it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from David. Bye. Audrey. Bye. Alessio. And Alexis. From Belgium. Au revoir.